Welcome to MIT Supply Chain Frontiers, where we discover the future of global supply chain education, research, and innovation. Brought to you by the MIT Center for Transportation and Logistics, every episode features center researchers and staff who welcome experts from the field for in-depth conversations about business, education, and beyond. Today, CTL Executive Director and Freight Lab founder Chris Kaplis speaks with Michelle Livingstone, Vice President of Transportation at the Home Depot. Take it away, Chris. Hi, today I'm talking with Michelle Livingstone, uh, for those who don't know, Home Depot was founded in 1978 and is the world's largest home improvement retailer with more than 2,200 stores across North America with revenues in excess of $110 billion. So welcome to MIT, Michelle. Thank you, Chris. So tell us a little bit about your role at uh, Home Depot. Well, I have the pleasure and privilege of leading the transportation for Home Depot, and that includes making sure that whatever we buy from around the world or domestically finds its way into a distribution center or a store, and we also help support customer deliveries as well. So how much of that is split between the international, I imagine just inbound international versus the domestic, the truckload and rail intermodal or any of that? Yeah, actually the domestic is our biggest expenditure, uh, but certainly international continues to grow. But as far as the problems and to solve, <laughs> is it is it the, does it follow the revenue or the, uh, the spend or is it international more, take more time to manage than the domestic? Well, it really depends on the year. Uh, so certainly in 2018, uh, when the domestic uh, transportation was a little more active, uh, a lot of time and energy went toward that. But you throw in a Hanjin closure or a MERSC right. cyber attack or a port closure, then suddenly international, although not the biggest expenditure, becomes the biggest head headache for right. sure. And something happening across the world, on the other side of the world, yes. has an impact on you. That's got to be a challenge. So it's a big job, and you've had it for little over a decade now. Yes. Is that right? Yes. So tell us how you got there. Actually, I'm one of those folks who graduated from Indiana University with a business degree and a concentration in transportation, and I've gone out to do exactly what I went to school for. So let, I'm... let me let me stop you. <laughs> what made you pick transportation when and is this is a, a master's specialization or was it undergrad? It was undergrad. Wow. And the reason that I chose transportation, it was because, uh, first of all, my dad was in trucking for all oh. of my life and, and most of his. So it's amazing how much you pick up uh, at the dinner table. So never wow. never underestimate the conversations you have at home with your kids. And then secondly, at the time, there were not many women in transportation. Right. And so as I was looking at the uh, salaries that graduating seniors were getting for finance and marketing and accounting and other disciplines, it turned out that the transportation graduates were making just as much. And coupled with the fact that there was a need for more women in the industry, mm -hmm. and I knew a little something about it, uh, it seemed like a great, great career decision. And I've never regretted it. Okay, so you, you graduated. And what, was your father a trucker? Or was he in the industry doing other things? He was. He worked for a, a LTL carrier. Okay. And then he went on and worked for a truckload carrier. Oh, and wow. he did operations and sales. Wow. So then um, tell us a little about the other uh, companies you worked with prior to coming to Home Depot. I spent the bulk of my career at Kraft Foods, and uh, that was a great experience. And then from there, I went to JCPenney, and uh, I was vice president of transportation for JCPenney. And then CNS Wholesale Grocers uh, called, and they were a customer of Kraft, so I was somewhat familiar with them. And um, they had an interesting vision at the time, and uh, so I packed my bags and went to Keene, Keen, New Hampshire. New Hampshire. Yeah. <laughs> and then Home Depot called uh, actually 12 years ago. And uh, it seemed at that point in time, they were making a big investment in their supply chain. And uh, it was warmer weather. And yeah, it both uh, seemed like a good idea. So I, was, I, I came south. Yeah, I was going to say CNS is the only one above the Mason-Dixon, right? You're only one <laughs> up in the, in the cold weather. Um, so you've worked in both manufacturing and, and retail. What have you find that's similar in those industries and what have you found that's different? Yeah, I mean, for the most part, uh, you're moving product from point A to point B. Uh, certainly in a manufacturing world, when you have an opportunity to shut down a manufacturing line uh, on time, that's really where right. I got my passion for on-time service because that's a little different. But even uh, the way that uh, things have changed and how mm -hmm. tightly we're scheduling trucks to match labor, uh, even though... Uh, ice cream may not melt, so to speak, as it does in the food world, right. um, that, that on-time component is just the same. So really, there's not much difference between retail and manufacturing. Uh, what what drives the urgency then? Because for manufacturing, yeah, you're stopping a line. Is it the 
worry of stocking out? It's definitely our need to make sure that we remain in stock. Uh, we're always trying to watch our inventory levels, and so we want to replenish product quickly. We're also trying to align the arrival of mm -hmm. a truck with store labor or DC labor as well, so that we're very efficient in that regard. So that's something that's getting a lot of attention now, because a lot of companies don't do that well. It seems like the warehouse doesn't talk to the transportation, and so you have these tremendous detention times at facilities. We are very fortunate that we have a drop trailer model, oh, and okay. so that we don't experience detention on within our own buildings for the most part. Um, where we occasionally encounter detention is from a vendor, but even uh, through conversations with the vendor, we're typically able to address what's ever creating those detention charges, either by changing our ordering day right. or time or by going to a drop trailer scenario as well. So by going, uh, is it almost exclusive drop trailer as much as possible? Yes. I assume. Yes. Does that limit the number of the type of carriers you can work with? The, yes, it does limit the number of carriers that we can do business with because not everyone uh, has that capability of dropping trailers. So, but it's it works well for us and it right. does give us the flexibility to do what we need to do. Right. So transportation has changed a lot in the thirty years. I mean, deregulation was now forty years ago. So forget that. But it took about a decade for it to ripple through. What do you think has changed the most over the last, say, 20, 30 years in, in managing transportation? What's stayed the same? Yeah, I think what's changed the most is really the technology, and and it's all for the better. So the visibility that we have now to loads and transit is tremendous. The data that we can gather right. on our network, our vendor network, our carrier network is tremendous. So I'm really, really pleased about all the technology improvements that mm -hmm. have occurred. And you know what really hasn't changed is that it still remains very much a relationship business. So even though the data is there and will drive to the right decisions, there's still a lot of relationship and people issues and opportunities that are just the same they were decades ago. Do you, it's funny because the, the um, availability of more data is like a double-edged sword, right? Because it's great to have all this data, but then you have all this data and you don't know what to do with it and it's not always good. Have you found it's, it's more of a benefit than a, a hassle now? Oh, it is definitely more of a benefit. Uh, Home Depot has made a significant investment in mm. supply chain analytics in particular okay. and analytics across the entire company. And it has just improved our, I would say, our street cred. Uh, it used to be that we would get a complaint and it was always a transportation problem because we were the last in right. the supply chain to touch the load. Uh, now, with our analytics, we were able to say that no, the vendor really didn't have the load available on time, or something really did happen in transit, and we just have better data to help folks focus on the right root cause. Right. And okay. it's really been a blessing. That makes sense. That makes sense. So let's let's talk about your current role. What's the one or two or three things that keep you up at night the most? You know, the good news is I'm sleeping very well in 2019 and 2020, so thank you for that. Uh, I think 2018 was uh, a more challenging year for us, and it was a good uh, reminder that we really have to stay current on changing market conditions. Uh, because transportation is cyclical and knowing when things are changing um, and being on top of that sooner is something that can certainly make one lose sleep. Right. Something else that keeps me up at night, uh, not not that I have too many sleepless nights, but it's really making sure that the talent is correct, that we're leading and growing our associates and that we have the, the right people, as we say, on the right bus and the right seat on the, on the you know at the right time. Right. So it's really more of a people and leadership opportunity. Do you, do you find, um, do you tend to try to promote from within and move people up or do you try to maybe uh, inject external people in at different levels from other organizations? Primarily, Home Depot is a company that promotes from within, okay. but we I, I was an example of someone that came in- You that, came in as a lateral. As a lateral, right? as, as vice president of transportation. So, And we do have that on occasion, but primarily, uh, we have great talent and are able right. to, to promote from within. It's easier to keep the culture that way, but sometimes it's, it helps the culture to have someone external come in. <laughs> yeah. Well, Home Depot is very passionate about the culture, right? and uh, we always say, if you take care of your associates, they take care of your customers, and the rest take care of itself, and th that- uh, Home Depot orange culture is critical to our success. Orange culture. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we, we bleed orange. We bleed orange. Um, so you said that, you know, one of the big things that you're trying to work on that keeps you up at night is talent management, essentially, making sure the right person's in the right role, developing the right people. And so what do you think are the top two or three skill sets that supply chain professionals, as well as transportation, need to have to be successful? I think the, the number one skill set is the ability to think end to end. 
you know, it's easy when you're just focusing on one component of a problem and optimizing on that one component, but you have to really understand and appreciate the impact from beginning to end. And so I think as our new supply chain leaders come in, that end to end thinking is going to be critical for success. How, how do you get them to, to think end to end? Because a lot of times it's, you know, it's funny. I love with the younger students because they don't think in the box. But once you get, you start your career, you start focusing, being an expert at one thing. How do you break them out of that and look end to end? Do you have certain skills, a rotation program? What do you do? Well, certainly there's no doubt that job rotations are, mm -hmm. are critical to success. And we always talk about our inventory planning and replenishment group as being the quarterback of supply chain. Ah. They're the ones that are deciding what's going to ship from where and when. And so that knowledge is great to have and we love to attract and retain folks from the our inventory planning group for that reason okay. so i do think a lot of it is how you lay out those career opportunities and i think it's also on how you pose the question as mm. well because depending on how you ask the question will get you a different answer so i think you know it's as a senior leader, you have that opportunity to say, hey, let me help you understand. Let's go out and see this. What is the impact? Did you think about this? So some of it is just case studies in real life, um, helping folks to think about beyond their beyond their, their, their scope. Let me ask you a question about, um, that we get this a lot here at MIT for students, there's soft skills and hard skills. And by soft skills, I mean the interpersonal, uh, working the corridors and being able to work on teams and everything. And then the hard skills, whether it's now it's becoming more important with data science, analytics, and those kind of things. Um, where do you see the mix between those and which is easier to teach? Mm, that's, a, that's a really good question. And, and prior to that lead in, I was uh -huh. going to say that the balancing the need between data and people ah, is really yeah. the key to success because the data will drive you to one answer potentially. But yes. again, you have to think about what is the impact on people and I would say I am a more of a people person. So mm -hmm. I would say, you know, learning the analytics is, is more challenging. I think if you're analytics, learning the people skills uh, definitely is, is more challenging, uh, but both can be learned. Right. So I think there are many, many ways to learn those skills. And part of it is just jumping in and doing it. And right. the other parts, the formal study and, and um, job, job training. Which is easier to get a trucker to learn math or a mathematician to learn trucking? Yeah, both both are definitely <laughs> challenging for without a doubt, which is why teams are good. Oh, there you go. You're so dodging the question. <laughs> That's okay. You need to have a mix of talent on your team. Yeah. Um, so what's the one skill that you wish you had had early in your career? Boy, I tell you, the one thing I wish I would have uh, known then that I know now is organization savvy and leadership hmm. savvy. And I'll tell you what I learned much later in life uh, than I probably should have is that I thought if I worked really hard and provided great results, that promotional opportunities were going to fall from the sky and I would be in great demand. What I didn't understand then that I understand now is a concept called pie. So pie is performance image and educate and um, exposure exposure okay. so performance is a given you have to be able to right, do your job right. effectively but what the components I was missing as I didn't realize they needed to be much more exposed I need more exposure uh, to senior leaders I didn't understand the the value of having a mentor I didn't understand what a sponsor was all of those corporate things that yeah. when you enter the the real work world uh, come to life later and I really wish uh, somebody had told me these things sooner uh, because I think I could have I've been very pleased with how my career has unfolded but I think I could have been more effective earlier if I would have been aware of some of these softer skills yeah. that you don't necessarily get taught in school yeah the exposure piece yeah you don't and if you're naturally um, uh, you know not an extrovert if you're an introvert it doesn't come naturally to you and some people just put themselves in the way do you think that's one of the challenges that women in general face that they don't go for that exposure or do you think it's regardless of gender uh, i think it is probably more prevalent for women mm. i think they think that if they work really hard the results are going to speak for themselves but what they fail to understand in men as well is that if if you're not known yeah then the chances of you getting that next opportunity are slim, whether it's being right. selected for the best project or being given an opportunity to have a conversation with a senior executive or right. whatever. If, if you're not known, you will not be selected for that. So now you're on the other side, right? Yes. And you're looking at it. And so you can see why the exposure is so important because you've got how many people 
indirectly or directly report to you at Home Depot? My department's got 135 people in it. Yeah, so you're not, you can't see them all every day. So if they don't expose, the onus is on them to do it. But do you try to look for those people of the strong performance that aren't doing the exposure? I, I do, uh, because I do recognize that. Okay. And certainly we do have a number of folks that are introverted, very analytical, right. and it's hard for them. Uh, and so we have to provide those opportunities. And so a lot of times I'll select uh, the least likely person mm -hmm. to lead a committee, for instance, on uh, voice of the associate. Okay. So go help us figure out how we can be a better department and go work with others and put them right. in that role and kind of grant them that opportunity because it's a lot easier a lot of times to meet someone when you say hey i'm on the special project may right. i talk to you about this as opposed to hey i'm walking down the hallway how do you deal with the idea that someone uh, the that it's okay to fail but that you need to improve because that a lot of times they do it i've had people they do it once and then they never want to do it again yeah that that is a hard one because not, none of us uh, want to be a failure we all want, want to exceed but part of that is also just continuing to build confidence yeah. in small steps right and okay. it really is uh, just reinforcing uh, that, hey, not everything's going to be a home run, but what did we learn from it? So that's really right. important. And I know at Home Depot, some groups actually have, uh, you know, like a good try award, <laughs> you know, oh, and recognition to say, hey, you know, you worked really hard on this project. It didn't develop uh, the way we wanted it to, but it wasn't from lack of effort. So right. good try. I know, I forget the name of the company. It was in Silicon Valley and they had a fail wall and it was filled with sticky pads and it was a thing of pride if you failed but if you got to fail you fail fast yes and then you learn from it and like the ceo had a big fail like we shouldn't have gone into that country and uh, i thought that was interesting interesting culture because here at academia we don't like to fail <laughs> <laughs> it's called a failing grade an f right so but that's that's an interesting thing how you get that culture where it's okay to experiment and you're not always gonna come out on top yes well michelle thank you for being here any any last words of advice or uh, that you want to partake on the podcast? Yes, I would just like to say there is a great career for uh, students in supply chain. There is a great need for that in the business world. And I am really optimistic that we'll be able to attract more women into the supply chain field in particular. And hopefully every CEO will at some point in time have supply chain in their background. That's great because when we were in school, supply chain didn't exist. So in a very short, very short period of time, um, it's become a major profession. So thank you again for coming, Michelle. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, everyone. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this edition of the MIT Supply Chain Frontiers. My name is Arthur Grau, Communications Officer for the Center. I invite you to visit us anytime at ctl.mit.edu or search for MIT Supply Chain Frontiers on your favorite listening platform. Until next time. <laughs>